was key in ending the French Indian War. And um, then those young men who trained at Fort Congaree would, Fort Congaree too would uh, later become heroes of the American Revolution. Among them, Francis Marion, the Moultrie brothers, Isaac Huger and Andrew Pickens. And then of course, we also have Fort Congaree one, um, which didn't serve much as a fort, but um, it became a trading post. And then Fort Gallman, um, a lot of people are not familiar with Fort Gallman. It was a settler's block house. And um, we think we kind of know the location of it. It's, it's very well protected and hard to get to, but that might be a future discovery for the um, 12,000 year history park. It's right in their boundaries. But today we're gonna to talk about Fort Granby. And um, in 1763, Joseph Kershaw of Camden um, partnered with some other men to, uh, in an effort to really expand trade into the interior of South Carolina. And in 1765, some things say, a lot of things say 1765, um, others say 1770. Trade post was built in the Conqueries by um, Joseph Kershaw and James Chestnut. And it was known as um, the post at the Congarees. This is a drawing uh, from about 1850. So this is well after the Revolutionary War. This, um, when this would have been, um, the building would have been called the Casey House or, or it became known as that. And um, today we have a replica of that, which is the Casey Historical Museum. And that large stone marker there in the front actually came from the site of the original building. And on it has some yeah, good in information. It has that 1775 date as, as a store that was at this site. And then it talks about the sieges of Fort Granby, which um, is what people are most familiar with. But it also has a couple of um, points down there after the second siege. Um, you have Ralden returning. So the British took it back for a few days. So that's gonna be interesting. I'll get to that. So in um, March, 1776, South Carolina adopted a new constitution. John Rutledge became the president of South Carolina and he quickly began strengthening the defenses of the state in preparation for war with the British. The um, spring of 1780, the British, however, took control of Charleston, and this really scattered the state troops and disorganized them. And over the next um, months, the British convert the Chestnut Kershaw store into a fort, and they built a ditch around it, a mound and a wood wall to um, fortify the store. Uh, the fort was run by British Major Andrew Maxwell and had a garrison of 300 men. Wade Hampton, and this is Wade Hampton the first, he was the grandfather of the Confederate General Wade Hampton. And the Friday family owned stores in the area and, and they were required to provide supplies to the fort. So when the British took over, um, you know, a, a big question over the years is when did the name Granby come in? Where did it come from? And um, I believe from all the research that it happened probably immediately when the British took this store over and they would have named it Granby. And why? Well, why is because there was a, a man named John Manners in England and he carried, he was in the line, a paternal line of men who carried the titles of Earls and Dukes of Rutland and the Marquise of Granby. So John Manners was the Marquise of Granby. And unlike a lot of these um, royal people who just carry these titles, um, Manners did some um, pretty amazing things. Um, he was the um, he was the commander of the British troops in the Seven Years War, and in 1760 he did some really amazing heroic things in the Battle of Warburg, um, which was against the French, a, a, an army that was three times the size of his, and he defeated them. and um, And as you can see in this, the, his French opponent actually was so impressed that he commissioned a portrait of Manners, and. Um, and John Manners went on, he had more victories in 1761 and 1762. So he was at that point in time, he was probably maybe one of the biggest heroes in England. And um, he, after the war, he, um, he was very well liked by his men. He gave them all pubs, the men that served directly under him. He bought and gave them pubs to operate. In fact, he went into great debt over this. And um, in 1770, he 
died in, in a lot of debt at just the age of 49. But I think at that point in time, 1770, you started seeing a lot of things being named after, after, um, the, after manners um, in, using the name Granby in England and in the colony. And in fact, in um, Great Britain today, the, the most common name for a pub is the Marquise of Granby. So that's how the name Granby came in. Um, after a year from the fall of Charleston, Governor Rutledge authorized five new regiments of state troops and to be organized by General Thomas Sumter. Uh, Colonel Wade Hampton would um, lead one of these and later in the year, um, more regiments were assembled led by um, Andrew Pickens and Francis Mary and a couple of the Fort Congaree II trainees. Um, while these new med, um, regiments came in, um, Hampton noticed that um, Fort Granby was running low on supplies. Hampton was a patriot and he informed General Sumter of this. And Sumter saw the opportunity and he attempted a, a siege of Fort Granby. Um, but he didn't have any weapons, so they had a fake cannon and um, Maxwell didn't fall for it and Sumter could only hold siege for about three days. But Sumter did go out and destroy um, all the nearby supplies that might be used by the British. So that, that marked the first siege of Fort Granby. Uh, to give you an idea of just how unprepared um, these guys were, Sumter's men wore um, hunting shirts made by the women of their families, um, deer skin, Indian moccasins on their feet, and their caps were decorated with um, the tail of a raccoon. Um, and their weapons were anywhere from a pitchfork to a hunting knife. But um, Sumter was the idol of these men and he exacted the utmost obedience from them. On May 1st, 1781, Colonel Henry Hampton came in and, and his group of men had been upgraded and they were ready to do some fighting. And they approached Friday's Ferry, which is three fourths of a mile from where um, Fort Granby was. And there was a, um, a, a group of um, men, the Prince of Wales, American volunteers who were guarding the ferry. And Hampton's men killed 13 of the guards and then chased down another five who were trying to get back to Fort Granby and they killed those five also. So what actually got us into the uh, archeology span of Granby was a discovery made um, by a, um, a local surveyor, William Shumpert, who with Platts, he had figured out exactly where Friday's, the road to Friday's Ferry was. And, um, he went down in the Congaree and discovered this structure, which was later dated to that period. And um, we, we got some property right near this, where this is at and began the Granby dig. And, and you know, now it's been nine years later, we've got over 20,000 artifacts, uh, mostly from the Granby period and, and before. So, um, and here's our dig site down on the bottom right corner is um, the property we're digging on. That corner of the property is where we found all the artifacts. There's two structures there, one from the Granby period and then one from the first Indian trader, Thomas Brown. And you can see where Friday's Ferry is up there. And, and a number of the items we find are musket balls and Hampton's men would have come from this direction. So, you know, we wonder, could this be part of that that battle that occurred. Um, of course, you can't date musket balls. It could be from 1700 to 1900, but, um, but we kind of like to imagine that it was part of that. Two weeks later then, after Hampton's action, um, we get Patriot Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lee came in and he had a real gun, a six pounder. And he set it up on the other side of the Congaree River. Uh, Lee was would be later become the future father of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. And um, Lee was very well known. He had um, won the Congressional Gold Medal. So Maxwell knew, knew that Lee was out there probably and knew who he was. And when the fog lifted, Lee's supporting troops moved forward and unleashed a volley of musket balls. And the show of force was so impressive that Maxwell chose to talk surrender. 
uh, before there was bloodshed. And this is a um, beautiful painting in the Casey Historical Museum that shows this event. Um, so here's the cannon on the Columbia side of the Congaree River, and that is Fort Granby. It had been a store, a nice store a few years earlier. Now it's a fortified fort. And um, so Maxwell and Lee, um, they agreed on the terms of surrender. Maxwell and his men were allowed to walk away with all these things they had stolen from people in the area. And when they got to Charleston to be prisoners, they were actually exchanged for Patriot prisoners. So they, they walked away with um, all the things they had acquired in their mission. So the second siege of Fort Granby was over and the Patriots got a fort loaded with guns and ammunition. And Lee and his men would um, tear down the Fort Granby fortifications at that point. Um, years later, the earthworks would be removed by a Casey family member. So the final event of the revolution that involved Fort Granby um, started taking shape um, a little bit later on, June 19th, when General Nathaniel Green, commander of the American Continental Army in the South, abandoned his siege at um, the British outpost at 96. Um, so 96 was about uh, 70 miles from Fort Granby, and it had been mostly run by loyalists and um, and leading the British forces there were, um, was British Lord Francis Rawlin. So going back to this marker, when you when we look down here at the bottom after the mention of the sieges of Fort Granby, we see where Rawlin reoccupied um, Fort Granby on July the 1st, only for three days. There's not a lot of information available about what happened there. But um, one thing that may have happened is where the legend of Revolutionary War heroine Emily Geiger comes in. So um, Emily was a descendant of the Geigers that came in to um, Saxe-Gotha, the first backcountry settlement right there in the 12,000 year history park. And um, Ann Geiger um, would actually own the Fort Granby house after the war. Um, she and Abraham Geiger, a longtime resident of the village of Granby, which would develop later on, are believed to be um, Emily's first cousins. So in an 1860 book, um, Benson John Losing gives his research interpretation of the story of Emily Geiger, um, which stated that Green had vital information that if delivered to Sumter in time could help coordinate an effort to defeat the British. Uh, Green prepared a letter to Sumter, but um, none of his men were um, um, very interested in, in, in taking on that mission of delivering it. Because um, there were the Tories were on alert as Ralden was approaching the Congaree. Um, Green, though, however, was happy to find this young girl, not more than 18 years old, who volunteered to take the message. And he he um, read the message to her so that she would know it in case she lost it. And um, and then she got on her horse and headed out, um, crossing the Wateree at the Camden Ferry, and then headed toward Sumter's camp. And that's, a, I think, a, a drawing from probably the 1800s showing Emily on her horse. Uh, passing through Dry Swamp on the second day, she was intercepted by some Tory scouts. Um, coming in the direction of Green's army, um, she was um, appeared to be very suspicious. So they, they took her in for a search and interrogation. But, you know, the British were, um, polite guys and they knew they couldn't search her themselves. So they had to send out for a woman to come search her. And, and while Emily was waiting, she ate the letter and um, they found nothing on her and they released her where she continued her mission and delivered um, the message to Green or the message from Green to Sumter. So the effect, you know, we don't know, we'll probably never really know the exact effect of the message, but it may have caused just enough delay to prevent British forces in South Carolina from aiding British General Charles Cornwallis, who was then forced to surrender to General George Washington and the French army in the Battle of Yorktown. And of course this surrender ended the American Revolution. So here is a picture of from 1900 of 
what was Fort Granby. It is now the Casey House. And, and there's a, I don't have time to go into the, how the city of Casey came about, but um, the Casey family um, was able to obtain this house and they lived in it for a while. And this picture in 1900, you can actually see in the, um, the steps of the front porch there in front of it is a table. And um, this was said to be the table that was owned by Cornwallis at Fort Graham. So, you know, they came out, this, uh, this, this picture was taken by a, a soldier who was in training at um, Camp Fornis, which was a Spanish-American war camp in um, 1898, around that time period. And he bought this camera with his first paycheck. And he, the guy actually took some beautiful pictures around Columbia, some of the best pictures we have from that period. And um, so the Casey family brought that table out. Obviously, it was something they thought was very important. And that table is, um, I don't know if we have anybody here from the Casey Historical Museum, maybe Andy's here, but um, that table is in the Casey Historical Museum right now. No, and Andy had, had, had another commitment, but yes. Uh, and then reminding people that a, a replica of this house uh, is actually uh, reconstructed to be the Casey Historical Museum that you can visit now. And, and like uh, David said, that that table is in the museum. Yeah, and um, it's good that you just mentioned that because the next slide actually compares the two. That's the Casey Historical Museum on the right, a replica of um, the original building. Mm -hmm. And um, they did a good job with that. And um, so what happened to this building? Um, well, it was later known as the Casey House and it was purchased by the Weston Brooker Quarry Company in 1923. The owners promised to preserve the structure, but it fell into disrepair during the Great Depression and World War II and um, eventually collapsed. I think somebody told me a, a storm came through and just tore down what was left of it. It had been getting stripped over the years, people coming in and getting um, souvenirs from it. And um, the land that it once stood on is now part of a 400 foot deep granite quarry hole. Of course, not a very good outcome for the most important historical structure in Lexington and Richland counties. But you know, the, the failure to save this in the Fort Congaree II site, um, as was recommended by Dr. Edwin Green in the 1930s, um, this points to you know, what I see as a dark time in local historic preservation. And, and yeah. we need to try and learn from this. And, um, and, and you know, here's just some graphics showing where the fort was located. So the, the image on the left is a 1930s aerial photo. The points one, two, and three are just reference points of common landmarks to line it up. And you can see the picture on the right, I think is an aerial photo from about six or seven years ago. So that quarry has actually expanded even more now, um, but you can see the location is now in the quarry. And um, a little more of a close up. So this is, in, um, so this is a drawing made 1810 to 1815 by Sarah Friday, the great granddaughter of Martin Friday, one of the founders of the village of Granby, which by the name, by the way, the village of Granby um, was eventually named that after the revolution, um, uh, just in, you know, because of Fort Granby, really. Fort Granby became um, famous because of the, the events that happened at the revolution and that and the village, which had been, that area had been known as just the Congarees before that. But um, I believe around 1886 or seven, when Columbia was formed, I think they decided that, you know, we need to nail a good name on this area here. Um, so it can be distinguished from Columbia. But but you can see over in the, the quarry hole, up there on the upper left is the um, the Casey house there and several structures. Um, um, and, um, and then on the right, you see the slag pile. Um, I think eventually that slag pile is gonna be moved back into the quarry hole. And, uh, and the, um, the current quarry owners, Martin Marietta, it's, it's no secret anymore. It's very public now. They are buying up property in the Riverland Park neighborhood, which holds the last remnants of Granby and Fort Congaree too. And um, 
they have specifically now recently stated that in 50 years, they expect to have all those properties bought and they will build another quarry hole there. And, um, you know, the only way I think to stop that, you know, we won't be here in 50 years from now, but, um, you know, the, 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 my hope is that something with the 12,000 year history park could push through some type of protection for that. So that was um, Fort Granby and you can find out more here. We have our, you know, the archeology span work and history work we've done at Granby um, that's at this website. And, uh, All right. Thank you, David. Uh, we have a, a, a question in the chat of, were all nearby stores required to supply the forts? It sounds like they were at that time. So there were, um, you know, there were there were quite a few stores that that drawing by Sarah Friday. You know, these are all a lot of these are people's houses, but they were also stores. Um, and of course, this was later on. This was in you know 1800. But I think at the time, you know, it, it documentation mentions specifically uh, Hampton store and the Friday family stores were required. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. We need to, to move on. That was that was fantastic. Uh, David's done so so much important archaeological and uh, uh, archival research on this area. Uh, he's a gold mine for information, and we really, really appreciate your being involved in our presentation today, David. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, so you, you stop sharing screen, and I'm going to turn it over to Adrian Stewart, Park Ranger at 96 National Historic Site. Uh, hello. Great. Hello. It's nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being available to participate in our presentation today. Well, thank you for having me. Let's see if I can figure out how to share this. <laughs> 96 is one of, one of my uh, favorite places. I worked with Stanley South there uh, during okay. some of the early archaeology, and I was yeah. invited back to give some talks there. So very special place for me. And it's a very important place. Can you see my screen? Yes. Looks awesome. Good. This is my first time doing it over Zoom, so I wasn't sure. You're doing good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Adrian Stewart. I am the park ranger at 96 National Historic Site in Greenwood County, South Carolina. Um, I've done my best to condense this down to the allotted time, so hopefully it won't go too far over. There's a lot to cover. Um, but 96 has a long history along the Cherokee path. Um, before the Europeans arrived, the area was being used for hunting by the Cherokee. Um, when the Europeans arrived, the deerskin trade really kind of kicks off and that is really what draws people into the backcountry and to 96. Um, a lot of your traders and your hunters came into the backcountry and they found a nice little spot to rest on their way to Kiowee at the spot that would become 96. Um, now we don't know exactly why it's called 96, but the most accepted theory is that they thought it was about 96 miles from the town of Kiowee. Um, anyway, let's see, where are you gonna change? All right, so finally in 1730, we do see 96 show up for the first time on an actual drawn map. Um, and this is George Hunter's map, who was surveying the trail. Um, if we zoom in, we can see 96 over on the left or on the right hand side between the Buffalo Swamp and Williams Creek. And then Kiowee, spelled a little bit different than we would today, um, west of Six Mile Creek. All right. Between 1752 and 1759, um, 140 tracts of land were surveyed and claimed along the Saluda River. Um, many of them were also along the 96 Creek. And so settlement really starts kind of slowly trickling in. One of the most prominent settlers of this time period was Robert Gowdy, who was one of those traders who had ventured into the mountains. Um, however, in 1751, he decided to stop traveling and open a trading post so people could come to him. 
Um, his post was located at the area of 96 along the Cherokee path. Activities at the post may have looked something like this picture here um, of men trading with their deer skin with the cabin in the background. Besides being a center for trade, it was also a nucleus for gathering, exchanging news, and for also assembling the militia. The construction of Fort Prince George on the Savannah River um, in 1753 increased the traffic through 96 even more. And despite the importance um, of the trading post, there's still no fort at 96. In 1759, Governor, Governor Littleton um, painted here in a, with a really long face, <laughs> dressed in a red robe, um, traveled through 96 on his way to Fort Prince George. This visit led to the construction of the first fort at 96. It was a very simple fort, um, and it was supposed, supposed to be a supply station and a magazine. It was going to be a strategic location between Fort Prince George and the Congaree. This first fort became known as Fort 96, and we will see several other forts um, with different names coming up. With the order given, a Gowdy's barn was turned into storage, um, and additional sheds were built to serve as barracks. The complex was enclosed by a 90 by 90 uh, foot square stockade. So just pieces of or logs put straight up and down in the ground and sharpened on one end. Unlike most forts of that time period, this fort did not have a ditch um, around the stockade, but there were two bastions on opposite corners of the fort to provide um, crossfire and some extra protection. The fort no longer exists, but we do kind of know where it was located. And if you walk the trail, the Gowdy Trail today at the park, um, you will come across the clearing that you'll see here. Um, and we try to keep the grass mode so that it kind of resembles the outline of what the fort would have been. Throughout the early 1760s, um, attacks on the backcountry by the Cherokee were common, um, and there were a few at 96. In January of 1760, a group of Cherokee led by a young warrior headed for the fort at 96, but the garrison was, was um, forewarned and they were able to prepare themselves and the surrounding residents were able to come into the fort for protection. Um, the, this attack only lasted about two hours. Um, nobody within the fort was killed. However, two of the Cherokee attackers were killed. After the attack, the refugees fearing more attacks would remain in the fort. Um, however, because of the close quarters, there would be a smallpox outbreak. And by the 22nd of February, two thirds of the male um, residents had contracted it. And in the end, it would end up killing 14 of the um, people within the walls. On March 3rd, there was a second attack. So exactly a month after that first one, um, this group of Cherokee was much larger, about a little over 200 attacking. Um, however, once again, they did receive warning beforehand. And so they did have time to prepare. They were well supplied as well for a siege. And so they were able to last 36 hours before the Cherokee learned that there was a relief column on the way, and so they withdrew. In the end, again, nobody was killed within the walls of the fort, um, but there were six Cherokee killed. The attacks continued in the area, but there would be no more at 96. Um, 
during this time period. The next year, um, in 1761, Colonel James Grant, who you see painted here um, with his white hair and red coat, set out to end the hostilities. He arrived in the Congarees in March. Um, he then sent Major William Moultrie and 220 soldiers to establish a supply base at 96. When they got to 96, they increased the size of the fort um, by expanding out the stockaded area and adding two new storehouses. As Grant reached the Cherokee territory, he began killing, um, burning towns, crops, and provisions. And this led towards the starvation of some of the Cherokee and basically forced the Cherokee's hand to sign a treaty. After the treaty was signed, the fort at 96 seems to have dis disappeared, um, probably falling into disrepair or those storage buildings being converted back to just you know, storage buildings for the trading post. After the French and Indian War, the settlement at 96 begins to boom again. Um, John Savage will buy 400 acres. Um, 10 of those acres will later be sold to turn into town lots. Um, roads and paths, of course, continue to be of the most importance in the area. Um, the brown sign you hear kind of shows you some of the important areas that the roads from 96 would lead to. We've got Charlestown, Kiowee, um, the Island Ford to cross the Saluda River, and of course the road to Augusta as well. As the population increased, so too did um, a lot of the troubles. Um, without law enforcement in the backcountry, since most of your law was handled in Charleston, the area became, kind of became the Wild West almost. Um, with outlaws, horse thieves, um, stealing, all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, things like you may see in this picture where some guys are killing a guy and stealing his horse and his clothes. Um, but the backcountry, like I said, becomes the Wild West. Um, finally, citizens decide they're taking the law into their own hand and form vigilante groups. Um, eventually, these vigilante groups kind of form into one big group known as the Regulators in 1767, um, and their headquarters are at 96. They decide they are going to uphold the law against villains. Um, however, they will also start punishing women who they deem immoral, um, punish lax providers of families, idlers, vagrants, and incorrigibles. Maybe not the best way to get some attention, but it does the trick. And in 1769, the Circuit Court Act is formed. Um, this act will create seven judicial districts um, in South Carolina, 96 being one of them. Um, as you can see in this map, um, this is from this counties of 1785 and it shows which districts incorporated which counties. Um, 96 is the farthest west. Um, each district is to have a jail and courthouse built. The one at 96 or the jail and courthouse at 96 were completed by November 1772. And so their court sessions were held in November and April. So courts being held twice a year. Settlement continues to increase. Um, and by the start of the Revolutionary War, we know there's about 12 houses in the town of 96, which of course by today's standards sounds tiny, but for that time period during the that country, that's, that's a pretty good sized town, um, along with your government buildings and businesses as well. Of course, the pressures are starting to build as the Revolutionary War grows near. 
And finally, in November of 1775, the dam kind of burst and militia groups on both sides began to gather. Um, Patriot militia leader Major Andrew Williamson musters about 562 men at Long Cane before he marches 296. They arrive early in the morning on November 19th um, and they above the ridge or on the ridge across from the town will begin building a hastily constructed fort, um, putting up walls between buildings and using fence rails, cowhides, and straws to create those walls. Um, meanwhile, the Loyalist militia under Patrick Cunningham and Ro Major Robinson muster around 1,900 men. Um, they arrive at 96 just a few hours after Williamson. Upon their arrival, um, they try to reach agreements. However, shots are fired. And so the first battle, Revolutionary War battle in the South on land um, kicks off. The battle um, lasts about three days. During that time period, two men are killed, one on each side, um, Captain Looper and James Birmingham. Finally, after those three days, they signal for a peace to be made and they are able to negotiate the peace. Um, part of those negotiations are that this hastily built fort, um, which we call Williamson's Fort, is to be dismantled or demolished without damaging the buildings that it was built around. Um, there won't be another fort on the area until 1780. Um, when the British take over South Carolina after the fall of Charleston. So after the fall of Charleston, um, 96 becomes a British outpost. Um, and it's like before the farthest west and was put under the command of um, Lieutenant Colonel Nesbitt Belfour. This outpost allowed the British to keep the backcountry um, patriots at check but also allowed for easy communication with the Cherokee. In addition, it served for a recruiting post, supply post, and also for a place to house prisoners. Um, it also was conveniently located for support to Camden and Augusta if needed. In August of 1780, command was handed over to Lieutenant Colonel John Harris Kruger who's pictured here. Um, he was from New York. Um, and this picture that you see is by Robert Wilson, um, dressed in his military red coat. Upon arriving, Kruger found the town enclosed by a crumbling stockade. Um, he realized the importance of being able to defend 96. And so he gets busy um, re-fortifying um, the town, putting up new palisades around it, constructing blockhouses on two of the corners, um, putting abbots around the town. Um, he'll also build a redoubt around the jail, um, which was located outside of the town. So, you know, providing a small fort there. Um, he'll also have a redoubt built across the Spring Branch where that 1775 fort was basically on the exact same location. Um, however, he's not happy with just leaving it there, he really feels like he needs the expertise of an engineer. And so he writes to Cornwallis asking him to send an engineer to advise him. Cornwallis eventually does. And in November, he sends Lieutenant Henry Haldane. Um, Haldane suggests to add the abbots around the town and also that he construct an eight-pointed star fort. Um, to the north of the town. So Major, this, Major, yes. You said you have, he took command in uh, 1781. He took command in 1780, is that correct? Uh, yes, 1780. Slide. Right, yeah. 1780. Oh, so okay. have, oh, yep, I, sorry. <laughs> I'm yeah. fingering too fast, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you. 1780. Um, so Kruger sets about set, uh, building the Star Fort 
which still remains at the park today. It's the original fort if you come visit the park. Um, it is constructed from the red clay in the area um, and it is built by the local enslaved population as well as the soldiers under Kruger's command. It is completed in early 1781 um, and this artist rendition um, kind of can give you an idea of what it may have looked like. Um, you can see sandbags on top and the um, uh, phrase sticking out of the sides of the fort. The walls of the fort were between 12 and 14 feet from the bottom of the moat to the tops of the walls. The phrase would have been about nine feet long. Um, and inside, of course, there's a traverse as well towards facing towards the north, which would have been the area where the Patriots would eventually attack from. Um, eventually, after the construction's completed, they also decide to add a gun battery also facing towards the north. Oops. Okay. Um, well, anyway, that fort is put to the test in May and June of 1781 when General Green attacks 96 and lays siege to it. Um, it is the longest field siege of the American Revolution. Um, and they are, the fort passes, 96 passes. They are able to withstand and hold out. Green is forced to withdraw when he finds out that Ralden is on his way with those reinforcements. And so he leaves. Um, and however, after that, in July, 96 is destroyed. The British decide that at this point, you know, it's basically kind of a little, I like to think of it as an island of British in a sea of patriots. Um, at this point, it's the last outpost in the backcountry, and it's really not feasible to hold it any longer. And so the British will abandon it. When they do that, they burn the town, basically burn anything they can, um, destroy what they can't take with them. Um, we're just lucky that it's a little harder to burn um, earth <laughs> than wood. So that's one of the reasons that the fort still exists today. But after the revolution, um, 96 kind of reforms, but it never quite gains its prominence. And there's really no forts to ever be built again, um, despite that. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview, um, just trying yeah. to be concise <laughs> a lot of history to go through yeah I, it's, it's quite a challenge and uh we could we could have several programs on just 96 for sure yeah uh, with all the components <laughs> there i wanted to mention that um 96 is one of the uh star examples of uh community support for historic preservation in that they the locals there lobbied the state to to form the star fort commission the yeah. start for it was still visible uh, in the 20th century. Um, and their, their efforts and uh, people like Strom Thurmond uh, support um, eventually created the National Historic Site. Um, it, but they, they deserve a lot of credit, a lot of local credit for saving that site. Yeah, it's Another really thing thanks to the locals. Is, yeah. Uh, during, the, um, during the siege, uh, uh, engineer by the name of Kosciuszko uh, was sent by Washington to Green, to aid Green. And he supervised the construction of a tunnel that was uh, gonna tunnel under the star fort and, and explode, exploded. Um, uh, they had to lift the siege before that tunnel was finished, but um, it's an interesting feature that you can see there uh, and it's interpreted at the park now. You can also, um, ETV a couple of years ago did their documentary on Kosciuszko's tunnel um, and they've got it on their website. So if you go to the ETV website, you can, if you're interested, you can check that out. Um, I think it's uh, called yeah. tunnel uh, or something like that. Kosciuszko uh, went back to Poland um, after the war, uh, tried to keep Poland on the map. He was not successful by the 1790s. Poland had been gobbled up by various countries taking it over. And when, when I was there once, uh, 
there's a big tall mound uh, to cut in honor of Kosciuszko. So there's a lot of uh, uh, across the ocean connections there that you can see uh, locally, but when you when you go overseas. So yeah. thanks, thanks, Adrian. Thanks so much for that. Um, You're welcome. You stop sharing your screen, and yep, wait a I'm going to start. I want to say a few things about. Uh, for Prince George, and let's see. Can you see that? Yes. For Prince George, okay. Um, for Prince George, I don't think, because one, one, one problem is it's uh, at the bottom of Lake Kiwi now. Uh, we lost the opportunity to, to do a thorough study of that fort. Uh, the historic preservation laws and the public um, uh, consciousness of historic preservation and the Star Fort Commission and things like that didn't get a, a lot of wind until um, until, until after the 60s or during the 60s. So that, that lake went in during the 60s. But at any rate, um, it was established for free storage in present day Pickens County uh, along the Kiwi River and established as Adrian pointed out during the French and Indian War. It was named for Prince George after the British Prince George, George William Frederick. Uh, who was then Prince of Wales. By 1778, it, it had abandoned. It, it was also known as Fort Kiwi and Kiwi Old Fort. Now, these are folks that there wouldn't be dressed this quite this well at um, Fort Prince George, but this is uh, of that period. Uh, these are some folks that came up from Charleston to participate in our March to Fort Congaree um, uh, program. Um, they are representing the 1750s, um, but gives you a little, little idea of uh, how folks would have looked. Not quite the finery, though, of the military uniforms. Like I mentioned, the fort was established in 1753 near the, the Cherokee village of Kiwi by Governor James Glenn. And it was mainly there to help regulate the trade, the deerskin trade, and uh, protect the Cherokee traders in the area. This is a, uh, on the left is a photo of a model made by um, one of the investigators that did the excavations, that the site, the plan map, the excavations on the right there. Um, and uh, it's a pretty, uh, I think a pretty accurate depiction um, based on the archeology. span the, the artifacts collected, we do have the artifacts, um, although when the lake was rising uh, in 1968, I think it was, um, uh, they had collected uh, probably, I think, several thousand artifacts. And those artifacts are now at the uh, South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology, University of South Carolina, as, as are, by the way, the artifacts from Fort Congaree One uh, that we talked about last time uh, right there in the 12,000 year history park. So both of those collections are at the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology and are being preserved and analyzed in a session for the public and for um, research. The Fort Prince George stockade was built as a 200 foot square with bastions and cannon mounts at each corner. You can see that in the, both of the photo of the model and the archeology span uh, plan map. It was surrounded by an outer ditch or moat and earthen walls that were topped with a palisade. 
Within the fort, the structures included the commander's quarters, barracks, magazine, kitchen, a guardhouse, and a well. The fort was built between 1756 and, and uh, or, or rebuilt, uh, uh, you know, shortly after it was built. They, these forts had to be constantly maintained and rebuilt. This is something that we don't talk about enough, I think, in the historical records. Whenever we're talking about fortifications or wooden fortifications, um, uh, maintenance was a constant uh, issue. One of the uh, major episodes at this fort during the French Indian War was uh, what was called the Anglo-Cherokee or the Cherokee War. Uh, the fort was besieged by the Cherokees for five months between January and June of 1760. The fort commander, Lieutenant Richard Cottymore, was ambushed and killed in February in retribution. And, the, and, and because of that, the garrison killed several Cherokee captives. The garrison was relieved and the siege was lifted when the British regulars and militia arrived in June. The garrison had suffered a smallpox epidemic during the siege, as, as was mentioned by uh, Adrian at 96, and may have lost more men to the ep epidemic than to the Cherokee attacks, it's, that's likely. We can certainly relate to epidemics these days. The maintenance of the fort was a continual occupation of the soldiers uh, and hired carpenters. The stockades of quote unquote light wood or yellow pine had to be replaced every four years during the life of the fort. In referring to the contemporaneous Fort Loudon, which we'll talk about uh, after this, uh, Raymond Demir wrote that the palisade should last six years instead of the previous estimate of three or four, since the trees were cut before the sap was up. Every commander had his own ideas about where the swivel gun should be placed, how the buildings were to be situated, how repairs should be made, on the bridge, the gates, and similar structural items. The workmen who did the building and repairs had to be entertained, so drummers being hired at several shillings, sixpence per day to beat the drums for them. There is continual reference to a drawbridge being needed, but the soldiers apparently uh, could not make one or did, did not have instructions for that. Um, uh, they finally got a carpenter up, but um, they called for a carpenter, but he was never sent to build that bridge. Even so, a letter from Lachlan Shaw to Littleton listed items needed at the fort. These included a small barrel of nails um, and 8, 8D, 10D, and 20D dimension, and two stout chains for a drawbridge, is what he said. However, there's no evidence that a, a drawbridge was ever constructed. That The model um, just has a, a normal bridge over the moat. In 1757, a massive rebuilding of the fort took place uh, of, of the instigation of the then commander of Lachlan Shaw. So like I mentioned the, the, the or uh, I should mention the excavations um, by the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology and others uh, between 1966 and 1968, uh, covered over by Lake Kiwi in the summer of 1968. A roadside marker is located at the entrance to Mile Creek County Park on State Road S39-327 uh, near the Kiwi Baptist Church. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, because of limitations of time, I won't go into more details about it, but the artifacts being preserved uh, and uh, presumably studied, and I think we'll be learning more about this fort as researchers and others um, look closer at that collection. It's a, a tragedy that the fort was covered before the thorough investigations could be done. And people like myself, if I had the awareness that I do now, I would have been lying in front of the bulldozers trying to save this fort. Um, you know, it's one of these things that was going to happen and you in uh, uh, no forces probably were going to stop it. I think um, today, uh, 
the Corps of Engineers would have a lot more to say about uh, destroying things like this before adequate documentation was um, conducted. I know that in my own experience in dealing with the Richard B. Russell collection down on the Savannah River, uh, that happened in the 1980s, uh, and very thorough investigations were done at, at those sites before the Richard B. Russell um, Reservoir came in. So I think if we had had, you know, 20 years later, we would have gotten a lot more information, but that's, that's here, neither here nor there. Well, this uh, concludes what I'm going to talk about for Fort Prince George as we move up the Cherokee path from Granby and uh, 96, Fort Prince George. We eventually get up into the, um, uh, over the mountains to uh, a very important outpost along the Cherokee path called Fort Loudon. And we have Eric Huey, uh, Ranger Eric Huey. Huey has generously uh, given his time to talk about that uh, fort. And uh, I think there are, there, of course, there are a lot of connections between all these forts during that time. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Eric. Well, thanks a lot. Let me see if I can get my share screen to work here. All right, can you guys see my yes. presentation yes. there? All right, good deal. I'm, I'm working off a laptop and a screen and a docking station and it shows it on both, half on one and half on the other for me. So it's a little <laughs> awkward. Um, that looks good. I, I will start with a little disclaimer here is the state updated us to Microsoft 365 five and I did the original slideshow when you asked me about this program on the old PowerPoint and the two wouldn't share with each other so I made a new PowerPoint this morning so this one's a little rougher but I think it'll still work just as well so as you pointed out Von Orr currently I mean today we we reside in Von Orr Tennessee is where Fort Loudon is um, at the time it would have been the Cherokee Overhill Territories uh, let me see if it'll let me get in here so I can actually move the slideshow forward. There we go. All right, come on. There we go. So what you had initially with us is, of course, uh, that history coming out of Fort Prince George directly reflects us. Uh, the commander, the initial commander sent to Fort Prince George uh, Captain Demeray was originally signed there and then found out while he was there that he was going to be sent here, uh, somewhat to his dismay and his shock. But what you have initially is a, a group of, uh, a small group of soldiers under the guidance of uh, Sergeant Gibbs and through the guiding of Atacula Kula, they cross over the mountains and into the Cherokee Overhill Territories where the uh, fort is to be built. The Cherokee had been asking for this fort for quite some time. I mean, easily you could look back into the 1740s and see where they had asked for a fort in the Overhill and, and the British really just hadn't found any justification for the expense. And then obviously with the, the beginnings of the French and Indian War coming and, and the territorial issues and trying to even compete amongst themselves between the South Carolinians and the Virginians for trade with the Cherokee, there's suddenly a push to do that, and that's the beginning of this. So, construction began in the fall of 1756. Uh, the, the initial construction is, is designed by Gerard de Brom, who would also design the defensive works of Charleston and map, do amazing mapping of Florida and some other areas. Uh, probably a very brilliant man in general, uh, but not a very good people person as it would come to be found out in his conflicts with uh, with Captain Demeray actually lead to the point where well, I'll discuss that when I get just a little bit further ahead, but come to the point where the two of them come to a head and actually Gerard de Brom flees within about, well, he doesn't, he doesn't consider it fleeing. He, he declares the fort construction completed in at Christmas of 1756 and he departs. Well, at that point, they've got partial power Let's say they've got no buildings inside the fort except the blacksmith shop um, and the fort's in a state of complete disarray uh, to the point where, you know, the Cherokee actually called it the, the fort to put pigs and cattle in. 
um, and the British agreed to a certain extent. So construction from there takes a swing and Captain Demeray, along with his officers, take over the design and the construction of the fort. And it goes from being a very, what was supposed to be a very elaborate uh, uh, period fort that de Brom had designed with these amazing double palisades and huge walls that eventually would be replaced with stone and really over-engineered for the place it was because they just didn't have the manpower or the ability to do that kind of construction. So you've got 200 provincial construction troops um, and then 100, give or take, British Redcoats, the independent company of South Carolina there, and construction takes place. So by, whoops. Within about nine months, you have the fort in what happened there was a posture of defense completed and in a posture of defense. Uh, shortly thereafter, the cannons arrived, which was a huge deal for the fort. Um, they ended up with 12 great guns. Uh, we don't know for certain what caliber the guns were. If you base it off one of two originals that were found in the valley back in the 60s, which we think were from the fort, uh, it's probably somewhere between a one and a three pound gun. It's a very large gun. They were hand-me-down guns, probably taken off of a salvage ship. We know that uh, Governor, when he got them, he got them from basically what amounted to an iron monger and sent them over. They had to be strapped across the back of a horse and brought over the mountains. And actually, Captain Demeray had left them at Fort Prince George. He didn't think the cannons would ever make it here. He brought the swivel guns, but he never brought the big guns. So once the big guns arrive, there's a huge celebration. The big guns are put up, and and his quote is, the very names of our great guns will be a terror to the French. And um, that put the fort in a whole different posture of defense because now you suddenly go from a fort that's basically just a large leaning palisade uh, system with firing ports for muskets to a fort def defended with 12 cannon plus roughly six swivel guns and two cohorn, two large cohorn mortars. So uh, I put these two pictures in here just because they depict two very influential points in the in the story. The top picture is from these, actually both these pictures are from the Parks Interpretive film, but the, the top picture is to, is supposed to depict Debrom and Raymond Demeray uh, arguing over the plans for the fort. And it actually got so heated that at one point, you know, uh, Debrom says that he should, if Demeray doesn't like his plans, he should take his pistol and shoot him in the head. And Demeray's response to that is, you should take your own pistol and shoot yourself in the head. And so that, that gives you a pretty good feeling for how these two men thought about each other and how badly this, this effort worked. And then the second major turning point in the fort is probably the transition of power. The, the whole time Raymond's here, he's writing letters to the governor asking to be replaced. He was an older gentleman for the period. He was he kept saying he was old and infirmed and he had his estates back in Georgia and South Carolina had, had kind of run amok and he needed to get home. And so lo and behold, the governor sends a replacement. Um, but unbeknownst to him until he arrives, supposedly, uh, it's his brother, Paul and Paul's the younger brother. He's of a different, uh, temperament and a different idea about the Cherokee in general. A lot of his writing you can see a transition in his thoughts towards the Cherokee and his attitudes towards the way the fort's going to function compared to his brothers. And he brings, a, I think, probably a little more, a little more brash and a little more of a younger man's thought to it, which, which doesn't help him in the end, but is what it is. So you end up with Fort Loudon. This is a painting that was done of the fort, uh, though not accurate as far as the general layout of the fort. It gives you a great representation of what the valley here looked like. The fort stood on a half on a hill and half off. Uh, right outside the gates of the fort was the Cherokee town of Tuskegee. And then all up that valley going towards the mountains in the back of the painting, there would have been the entire overhill Cherokee nation going as all the way up to the mountains, basically. So the fort is placed, generally speaking, 150 miles from Fort Prince George. So it, and you have to cross the mountains and go through the entire Cherokee overhill uh, really the middle and overhill settlements to get there 
So in the general sense, it's very isolated, which will lead to its its downfall in the end, as so many military things have, where you your your chain of supply becomes your issue. So, you know, the first two years are very good. Trade is the primary thing happening in and around the fort. The Cherokee were very excited because they thought having the British soldiers here would help with the uh, monitoring the trade, the traders, the licensed traders in the valley, and that maybe they wouldn't get cheated as much. Uh, the traders were excited because they thought that uh, having the, the British here would help keep out the French traders and the French influence. To some degree, it helped with both, um, though that you, I mean, the, anybody that's read any of the letters or writings from both parties during the period, it continued to be a problem. But trade did take place in and around the fort um, and was a major, major thing here in the valley. Towards the end of 1758, and certainly into 1759, you start to see things fall apart. I think we, we've discussed it a little bit here uh, already. I know with 96, talking about the the uh, the issues with settle, settlers and the and the Cherokees, um, and so you start to have this breakdown between the Cherokee and the British, especially as it relates to the the government of South Carolina. And, and Virginia as well. And so the governor sends 100, roughly 100 provincial soldiers here to reinforce the fort. So at this point, you've got close to 200 soldiers here. And we think based on, on documentation, about 50, 50 plus or minus civilians. So mostly women and children, but also some civilian males as well. And so you run into this loose period where the Cherokee, I mean, you're 150 miles out in the middle of Cherokee territory. It's not hard to understand why the Cherokee chose this fort. And also French, Fort Prince George attacking both, really, not simultaneously, but near the same time. It was just much more effective here because they were out here. Um, and it was hard for the British to get here to reinforce. So in the end, they end up holding the fort in a loose siege for roughly nine months um, to the point where Demeray's officers come to him and, and basically give him the ultimatum of either surrendering or the desertion is going to get to a level where it won't matter. So this is the first formal surrender, written surrender with a native, with Native Americans and the, between the Native Americans and the British. And they find, they sign formal papers and uh, to, uh, to Conestoga and the headmen of the Cherokee and the fort surrenders and they march out with their weapons and their flag and their, there been the agreement according to the, the terms of the treaty was they'd be allowed to march back to either Virginia or Charleston. Um, and the Cherokee would provide both rent, would either rent them or provide them horses and allow a certain number of Cherokee men to go with them to hunt. They get about 15 miles from the fort the first day close to where Teleco Plains is and the village of Teleco. And the next morning they're ambushed the accounts you read anywhere from three to 700 uh, Cherokee warriors attacked this party of anywhere from two to 250 people. They kill all the officers, but one outright, well, two, because they don't kill Demeray outright either. And they end up taking everyone else hostage and taking them back to, to the Cherokee towns. And over the next year, the majority of the people are released or paroled back to uh, British colonies. Um, Demeray doesn't fare as well. He's end up, they end up, there's all kinds of stories about what they do to him, but he shot twice during the initial attack. And then supposedly he's drawn and quartered and his parts are hung in the different Cherokee towns as a warning to, to the British. Um, any way you look at it, it didn't end well for him. And uh, this is the last painting in our fort's depiction of the battle that took place there in the field. So this is Fort Loudoun as, as, as it is today. And uh, John, I have to agree with you. I think it's I, anybody that has to deal with a fort and you know, I've been here at Fort Loudoun uh, going on 20 years. I've seen the construction of, I mean, you look at that picture there. When I came to work here, there were four buildings in the fort and we've constructed, the staff here has constructed everything else that's in that fort in that time. Um, except the stonework, we don't do that. We actually hire a stonemason because just like back then when they built the fireplaces and they fell down, that's what would happen if we built them. 
but I think it's under underwritten the volume of labor it takes to maintain a wooden fort even today, let alone, you know, in the 1700s or earlier. And, and Demeray actually writes about that. He's got, you know, he's got uh, six men that do nothing but maintain the hedge outside. He's got 20 men that do nothing but maintain the palisade on a daily basis. Um, and that's after it's completed. That doesn't really even discuss during the time of construction. And I can tell you firsthand, it, you know, you get about the bastions of the corner platforms. Uh, before we started experimenting with treated lumber that looks very much like the original lumber, we were lucky to get three years out of a out of a bastion. So if you're looking at it from the same standpoint they are, you're basically rebuilding your fort once every five years, um, replacing everything from the shingles are about the only thing you can get away with because those nice oak shake shingles last a long time, but everything else is in a constant rotation. And uh, it just speaks to how tough it would be to have this fortification this far from everything with a very small staff and no one that really knew engineering skills. So, you know, we're, we're on an island now, thanks to TVA. They, they dammed up our lake just like they did, just like the Corps did. Thankfully, the more for somebody had the foresight, it was the Fort Loudon Association who owned the property mostly, to do a great deal of archaeology. There were three different periods of archaeology on this site. So we have a lot of good archaeology. Um, and the site is obviously currently owned by the Tennessee State Parks. Uh, but we're now surrounded by a lake. We're on an island as a result of the impoundment. And so, uh, and just for facts, we see about 250,000 people a year through here. So we have a pretty high visitation rate. Um, and we work really hard at trying to keep our programming and the Ford up. I, I hope that gives you guys the general information. Like all of our sites, there's so much information we could share. This could go on for days, but uh, I hope that that gives you general general information about us and you get to come see us if you can. Thanks, Eric. That was great. Um, you know, we all are uh, bound by very cursory over, overviews on how we talk about these sites because we could have a week of programs on each site, but uh, this maybe gives people a, an inkling of what was there. Um, <clears throat> the commitment of resources when these forts were constructed, um, I don't think people understand uh, that um, it, by definition, it was going to be a constant vigilant effort to um, maintain these. Even if you fast forward to the Civil War, the um, after the fall of Fort Pulaski, when they decided that masonry forts were no longer uh, viable and they went back to earthen forts, they, um, we have records that though even those forts were immediately, immediately starting to be repaired after they were constructed. So um, does anyone have questions for any of the presenters, for Eric or any, any of the others uh, that we've had on this morning? Unmute uh, yourself and speak up. John, it's uh, DC. I was. Uh, it's, this is directed toward Eric. Uh, the uh, last painting. I didn't get a good look at that, and uh, I, I, you know, I'll replicate native weaponry. And the Cherokee there in the painting had a war club, and I wanted to get a better look at the painting. Uh, if Eric doesn't mind. Yeah, let me just a second. Let me see if I can pull that back up. There we go. Um, Eric, we see a squirrel with a shield. <laughs> hey, I don't know what that painting is, but it's cool. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's you've got the world, the squirrel on a toad. Is that what came up? Yeah, that's pretty. That's yes, pretty. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. That wasn't. Let me just I'm, pull the straight picture up of the. I'm glad the squirrels in our yard aren't like that. <laughs> I'm glad the frogs are not like that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I think if you start screen sharing again, or, or if you go back to that slideshow there. Yeah, I'm trying to get the screen share to come back up. I'm having trouble getting my, somehow all I've got down to now is you guys and the rest of it's disappeared. 
because it tells us uh, that we're viewing your screen. Yeah, Dan, Dan just popped the message up there. I didn't, I didn't see all of it, but any, any kind of uh, photographs or artwork that depict their uh, clothing and weaponry is always helpful to me to get little hints and clues and better ideas, you know? So yeah, uh, y'all feel free to send that to my email or text it to me or whatever. I'm, I'm very open to that. So, um, okay. Thanks DC. Sure, I'm, uh, I'm all a little bit more, you know, DC Locke is one of our uh, volunteers at 12,000 Year History Park and has done some great things for us in terms of helping us out with not only the 18th century programs, but uh, Civil War. And he puts a lot of effort into uh, the paraphernalia that he provides during the programs. So are you? Are we back in with you, Eric? Or? Yeah, you're still here with me. I'm just pulling up the... I didn't mean to cause any trouble. Oh, no, well, you know, it is what it is. Nothing not, wants to play well with others today. Try to read. Try May to read. I ask a question of Mr. Brinkman? Yes. Okay. Um, I wondered if you had found any archaeological remains of uh, Governor Pinckney's residence that was um, allegedly on the, the Casey side of the river near Columbia, near Granby. And no, we, we haven't been there where I, I did at one point, I think we was with some others, we were trying to locate that site, you know, I think we found some plats or something that um, led to it. But no, we've, I've, I've never been there even on foot, just walking around. I, well, one of the, uh, real quickly, one of the mentioned possible places for that uh, is in the 12,000 year history park um, near the earthworks. but. Um, there's some doubts about whether that was actually connected with Pingney, but we need to do more investigations, more archival work, and more archaeology to determine that, Kathy. Yeah, uh, let me interject something here. Um, Thank you. Real quick, it's not related to this presentation necessarily, but while I'm thinking about it before I forget, uh, one of the neighbors now at the end of our neighborhood has been asking me to come metal detecting her yard for the past year. Uh, and we got there in her backyard last Thursday and I found a lot of iron artifacts. But what stood out to me uh, is there's earthworks behind her property that probably stretch about 200 yards. And I'm wondering if they might be an extension of the earthworks down at Congre Creek. The artifacts that we found metal detecting, they're real corroded and I've got them in a plastic bag, damp. And she said, if they're anything significant, please donate them to the local museum, but I can't tell much about them. But those earthworks look old. I took some pictures of them, I can send those out. And uh, anybody that wants to see them, I'm sure I can arrange to get back there and let y'all see them, but they're, they're I just find it odd that they're back there like they are. And I um, don't know what's going on with that, but I just wanted to throw that out, and, you know, let, make y'all aware of that. And I'll send some pictures out pretty soon. Okay, DC. You, you think they might be associated with the Civil War? Earthworks? Well, I don't know if they're uh, war between the states, uh, earthworks, or maybe something to, you know, uh, keep the water away from uh, the, what used to be there. The woman that lives there said there used to be a barn or a house that was uh, there on, in the area prior to the war between the states. And uh, I, what, I'm, what we found, I think, might be related to the barn. But um, it could, the airports could have something to do with that to prevent the, well, the creek overflows because Conger Creek's just a few yards back. Yeah. And I don't know, uh, somebody that knows more about that uh, area and how things were supposed to be laid out for the earthworks and all might can tell more. It's, just, it's hard to tell, but, they're, just, but I, they're there. I've heard about them for for past several years. I finally saw them. They are definitely there. They are definitely old. Okay, well, thank, thanks, DC. Uh, any, any other questions to any of our presenters? today. I do have John. I have a it's Starfort Brick 
I believe this was given to my dad in the 1970s. He was the director of the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. Uh -huh. It actually says brick from the old 96 jail. Real. And it's built 1769. It says it was destroyed by the British 1781. And then it says restored by question mark. So I'm suspecting maybe PRT. <laughs> what might have been involved or something in trying to restore that? Do you know? <laughs> um, well, the jail, as far as I never know, never been restored. Um, okay. <laughs> it's still a pile of brick, or at least the bricks that are left from people you know, <laughs> for other, using them for other buildings and stuff like that. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, I, I, have no clue. <laughs> I wondered what happened to it. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Hold of some strange stuff, David, you know? Hey, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to be in that jail. Uh, no. I'll tell you. Um, uh, especially if they were going after idleness and immoral folks. Uh, who knows who knows who would have ended up there according to the regulators, you know, it's probably just well, the regulators the thankfully didn't have that jail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions or comments? And um, that's quite, a, quite an artifact you have there, David. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Eric. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that uh, we, uh, this is, I think the 16th or 17th Zoom that we've had uh, because of the pandemic, we've not been able to get out in the park to do our normal programs. We hope to resume that, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, certainly by June, if not before. Um, we may even try to do a Civil War encampment um, in May, if I can get the city to go along with that in terms of uh, the COVID restrictions. But um, we'll wait and see on that. But we're, we're planning to do other um, uh, Zooms on the resources, both natural and cultural resources of the park. Uh, please, when you have a chance, come out to the 12,000 year history park. It's uh, near the corner of 12th Street Extension and I-77 at the Casey Tennis Center. Uh, we have um, uh, a Civil War battle site there. We have the site, the original site of the 1718 Fort Congaree and 20,000 artifacts that were collected there and are stored there at the University of South Carolina now. Um, we have um, what we're going to be talking about um, in the future, uh, the uh, historic river crossing there at Congaree Creek, where not only was it used as part of the Cherokee Path prehistorically and trade during the Congaree's uh, episodes, um, but it was uh, uh, the, the site of a couple of Revolutionary War engagements and the um, Lattice Trust Bridge uh, de designed by Ishmael Town, um, who is a renowned national architect. There was a covered trust bridge there built in 1820, the state sponsored bridge, which we have, don't, haven't talked about much in the park, but those kind of things, we have a very, an abundant um, variety of resources in the park and we're gonna be telling those stories in the future. So hopefully we'll see you back out there. Um, uh, I think a very interesting trek if someone wanted to do would be to a uh, Cherokee path trek from Charleston up to uh, Fort Mott. We've had that presentation. And then the, the, the Congaree forts. Congaree forts are almost as complex or maybe more complex than 96 because there was so much there. Fort Congaree one and two, uh, Fort Granby, and then 96 and Fort Loudoun. We have quite a legacy of important history that uh, I think David pointed out uh, had a lot to do with how the Revolutionary War turned out and also the Civil War and all the major periods uh, of South Carolina and the Carolinas there. So we hope to see you out at the park. Um, uh, stay tuned for other programs to the uh, 12,000 years, 12, Casey 12,000 years.com to our website for for future programs. And I wanna thank the speakers. You were outstanding and uh, fairly short notice to get all these presentations together. Uh, I, hopefully people enjoyed it and I certainly learned a lot today. So thank you very much.
I guess we'll wind it up if not if there are not any more questions. No. Thank thanks. you. Thanks, Gabriel. Eric, Adrian, David. Uh, thanks for your questions, guys. Uh, Till next time, we're going to be having uh, on March 30th. We're going to have a program on butterflies, uh, concentrating on butterflies in the 12,000 year history park. So um, we'll we'll be doing and uh, creating other programs as we go. So take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, John.